Dripping down science. The naked scientists. Well, hello. It is Sunday, the 26th of September. Welcome to a brand new series of The Naked Scientists. It's me, Chris Smith, and also Kat Arnie. Hello, Kat. Hello. Well, this week we're reading your mind. We'll take a look at how recent advances in brain scanning technology can allow a computer to work out what someone is looking at and then rebuild a picture of what they're seeing. Plus, we'll also be hearing how researchers are using brain scanning techniques to work out what's happening when people experience things like hallucinations, for instance, seeing things that aren't really there. That's all coming up this week, Kat. Thanks, Chris. Also this week, news of how injured nerve cells regrow and what it can tell us about how cancer spreads. Plus, a new breakthrough in understanding the damage done by MS, multiple sclerosis. We'll also have the answer to this rather fruity question of the week. My friend the other day told me not to eat my apple core and made me throw it in the bin. Are they poisonous? So, will an apple a day keep the doctor away, or are they actually bad for you? Stay with us to find out. Kat, thank you very much. So do send in your thoughts, comments or questions. You can use email. It's chris at thenakedscientists.com. You can tweet them to at Naked Scientists or scribble them down on our Facebook page of the same name. Laying the facts bare. The Naked Scientists. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientists.com. Well, let's kick off, as we always do, with a look at what's hot around the world this week in the world of science. Kat, what have you got for us? I have a very interesting story this week. Now, cancer is a disease that's caused by cells multiplying out of control, and it's been known by many names throughout history, some of them probably unrepeatable on air from people and families who've been affected by the disease. But one ancient name is the wound that does not heal. And today, researchers are uncovering many similarities between the controlled cell production required for wound healing and how this process is hijacked in cancer. And now new results from a Cancer Research UK funded team led by Professor Alison Lloyd at University College London have found an important link between nerve repair and how tumours may actually spread within the nervous system. And they've just published their findings this week in the journal Cell. So take a little bit of a step back, first of all. How are nerves normally repaired? Well, our nerves are actually pretty good at repairing themselves, contrary to popular belief, although it doesn't always work in the case of severe damage or crushing, for example. Uh, But nerves can grow back through deep cuts, and it's possible to reattach amputated fingers, toes and even limbs and have some regrowth of the nerves there. And this is all down to special cells called Schwann cells. Which are what exactly? Well, Schwann cells act a bit like insulation around nerves, a bit like sort of the plastic coating around electrical wires. And normally they help to speed up the nerve impulses, but we know that they're actually really important for directing nerve repair. Now, when a nerve is cut, the Schwann cells start growing out into that wound and they start laying down guide tracks for the nerves to grow along. And here's where the new research from Professor Lloyd and her team comes in. They've uncovered some of the complex molecular signals that control this process. And what are those signals? What have they found? Well, the researchers were looking at exactly how these Schwann cells are controlled and directed into these guide tracks by fibroblasts. These are repair cells that gather at the site of a wound. And the team discovered that fibroblasts produce a little signal molecule called Efrin B, and that's received by receptor proteins on the surface of the Schwann cells called FB2. That's Efrin receptor B2. Now, it's this Efrin signalling that tells the Schwann cells to organise themselves into tracks, as directed by the fibroblasts, so that the nerves can regrow. So this is your cellular equivalent of the policeman who stands in the centre of the road waving his hands saying, you stop, you go and so on. Exactly, directing cars into different queues. And importantly, the scientists found that switching off this Efrin signalling meant that Schwann cells couldn't repair nerve damage and that shows that it's a really fundamental part of this process. So these findings tell us something really important about nerve repair and that's going to be useful for researchers who are working on techniques like nerve grafts, trying to repair damaged nerves after accidents or after surgery. Indeed, but you also said this was linked to cancer. So what's the cancer connection? 
Well, we do know that some types of cancer can spread along nerve cells. And in fact, the way they do this looks very similar to the way that Schwann cells and fibroblasts move when they're repairing damaged nerves. And it's very likely that this efferent signalling is also involved. And so Professor, uh, Professor Lloyd thinks that these cancer cells may be acting a bit like an unhealed wound. They're hijacking the same kind of signals that normally repair nerves. Now, in a normal situation, these regrowth signals would be switched on when repair is needed and then switched off when the nerves have grown along the Schwann cell tracks and, and completed the wound. But in cancer, maybe it is that these signals don't get switched off, so cancer cells carry on spreading along the nerves rather than settling down and sort of healing. So understanding how this signalling goes wrong, how we can block it, it could prove to be an interesting lead for future treatments that stop cancer from spreading in the nervous system. Thank you, Kat. Very interesting. Now, also this week, sticking with the nervous system, because we are focusing our programme on that, for, for starters, but uh, there's a very interesting story that's emerged from Germany, which uh, pertains to multiple sclerosis, MS. Now, multiple sclerosis is a disease of the brain and central nervous system. It doesn't affect the peripheral nervous system, the thing that supplies your arms and legs, for example. And what happens in MS is that the nervous system is attacked by the immune system, because a component of the myelin, this is the sheathing that wraps around nerve cells is directed out and singled out for attack by immune cells which go in and destroy that myelin and in the process they stop messages going along nerve cells properly and this causes a person to become disabled. It can cause problems with vision, it can cause problems with movements and it can also cause other issues to do with coordination, balance, hearing and so on. So any bit of the nervous system can be involved and usually it's relentless so it may keep coming on and causing progressive damage which leaves a person more and more disabled. Well that's at least what we thought because what's becoming apparent is that, or at least according to this new bit of research, it's not just that myelin, that electrical insulating material, which is being singled out for attack. There's a paper in the journal Immunity this week by Volker Sifrin and his colleagues, and they're based at the Johannes Gutenberg University in Germany. And what they find is that, in a very clever way, it looks like the immune system is also attacking nerve cells. And why this is important is that if we're going to treat the symptoms and arrest the process of MS, we can't ignore damage to nerve cells, assuming that all the damage is happening to this myelin. The way they did this was they made genetically modified mice in which the mice have immune cells that make a red-coloured protein, originally from jellyfish, actually. So you can single out red cell, uh, the red cells as being immune cells, and the mice also make nerve cells, which are green. So any nerve cell in the mouse's body is going to have a green colour to it, and all the immune cells are going to have a red colour. And when they looked at these mice, which then go on to develop the rodent equivalent of multiple sclerosis, it's a rodent model of that, they were able to see what the cells are doing relative to each other. And they found and no one's seen this before, a certain population of white blood cells, which are called TH17 lymphocytes, they were snuggling up next to nerve cells and creating a connection to them called an immune synapse. And this is where the cells reach out and touch each other, almost like a handshake. And what was happening was that the immune cell appears to be damaging the nerve cell that it's contacting because the, the team were able to see that inside the nerve cell where this is happening, you get a big spike or a big flash of calcium going into the cell. And calcium is a very important signal in cells. It makes them more electrically active. And if too much calcium goes in, cells can become over stimulated and they go into a, a cascade called an excitotoxic cascade. The cells literally excite themselves to death. So it looks like in MS it's not just the immune system attacking this myelin sheath. The immune system is also attacking and triggering damage in nerve cells and if we understand the underpinnings of this damage it might be possible to arrest some of the damage done in MS to those nerve cells by giving drugs that can stop this calcium going in rather than just trying to stop the immune system attacking the myelin. Cat. So in, in epilepsy and diseases like that, the sort of the nerves are overexcited, is it possible that some anti-epileptic drugs might be useful? It's possible, yes. Um, and part of the reason is uh, that one of the ways in which cells get active is when things like calcium and sodium go into cells. And so drugs have been made which can block up the pathways that allow those chemicals sodium and calcium into nerve cells and another interesting thing to look at is stroke because in stroke when the brain is deprived of oxygen for a short time again you get overstimulation of nerve cells and there are now drugs being made which will block up a kind of receptor called an NMDA receptor which allows these calcium uh, ions to go into cells and so trying some of these drugs in the context of early MS could make a very big difference to the clinical outcome for people who unfortunately succumb to it. 
Oh, well, let's hope so. Anyway, on to malaria now and a breakthrough in our understanding of where this parasitic blood infection, it's transmitted by mosquitoes, actually came from in the first place. Now, historically, scientists thought that the most severe form of this disease, known as falciparum malaria, first spread into humans from chimps. But now, by looking for the parasitic DNA in faecal samples, that's poo to you and me, uh, from thousands of wild apes, including chimpanzees, gorillas and bonobos, Edinburgh University's Paul Sharp and his colleagues have found that, in fact, it was gorillas that gave us malaria rather than chimps. He talked to our own Smita Mundasad through the work. Before we set out on, on this particular study, there was one species of plasmodium known to infect chimpanzees. That species called Plasmodium raikinawi, which is quite closely related to Plasmodium falciparum, the, the worst cause of malaria in humans. What we've subsequently found is that there are, in fact, six similar species of plasmodium, and we found three species of plasmodium that only infect gorillas. When we compare those different species of ape plasmodium to the human species, all the evidence suggests that the human plasmodium has originated by a jump from gorillas to humans. What implications does that have now for our understanding of malaria? Well, the initial aspect of this, of course, is just that it satisfies our curiosity about where humans acquired their plasmodium parasite from in the first place. But ultimately, it can also prompt us or others to ask whether there are any differences between the strains that infect gorillas and infect humans. For example, it looks like only one of those six species has successfully jumped into humans, and it looks like it may have only done it on one occasion. These parasites are transmitted from ape to ape by mosquitoes, and we would expect those mosquitoes also to be biting humans who live in close proximity to the apes. And so we would expect there have been many opportunities for those plasmodium parasites to infect humans, but most of those occasions they simply aren't successful. So it looks like the gorilla strain that did make it into humans must have undergone some kind of adaptation. It would be really interesting to find out what that was. Could these findings lead in some way to find treatments in the end? Any additional knowledge about what it is about these strains that allows them to infect humans or doesn't allow them to infect humans could lead to insights for therapies. Perhaps the most important implication of the work is that it says that there are these other species of parasites out there that might have the potential to infect humans in the future. And that would be particularly important if people were successful in curing humans of Plasmodium falciparum. There's the possibility that we're simply opening up the niche for one of these other ape parasites to jump into humans. Has this research thrown up any new questions? There are all sorts of questions that arise out of this. We never find one of the chimpanzee parasites in faecal samples from gorillas, and we never find one of the gorilla parasites in faecal samples from chimps. And so presumably there's something about whether these parasites can successfully infect blood samples of other species. Certainly intriguing to figure out what is that species specificity. And of course that then leads into the question of whether that specificity could change so that any of those parasites could infect humans in the future. Do you have plans for further research? We do hope to look, first of all, at human samples to see whether any of these other ape species of plasmodium have made it into humans. We also want to look further at the ape samples because Plasmodium falciparum, although it is the most common form of Plasmodium causing malaria in humans, is only one of four or five different species of Plasmodium that, that infect humans. And so we haven't really looked extensively at these ape samples to see whether any whether the apes are infected by relatives of these other plasmodium species that infect humans. That was Paul Sharp from Edinburgh University talking to Smita Mundasad. And that work appeared in the journal Nature this week. And there's also a longer version of that interview on our website at thenakedscientist.com slash specials. Thanks, Kat. Well, I've got another story for you here, and I'm going to begin by asking you to predict what you might think goes on here, Kat. It's actually a thing called the thermal grill illusion, and it might actually hold the key, this piece of research, to understanding why people develop things like phantom limb pain if someone has an amputation, why the missing leg or arm they no longer have is nonetheless excruciatingly painful for the person that used to possess it. What do you do with this illusion? If you imagine, if you hold your right hand and you're looking at it palm forward. If you were to take your index finger 
and put that in a little pot which had water at 43 degrees C. And you then dangle your longest finger next to it into a pot which had water at 14 degrees C, so cool water. And then you had water uh, in another pot at 43 degrees into which you inserted your ring finger, in other words, the one on the other side of the longest finger. What would you think you would feel if you were asked with the blindfold on, what's happening to my finger? What do you think would happen? It's the same as the trick where you do when you're a kid where it makes you wet yourself. No, you don't wee, hopefully, <laughs> but you do experience something phenomenal. Uh, would, uh, would they all feel hot? Would the cold one feel hot as well? You're on the right lines. Actually, this illusion produces a sensation of excruciating pain in that middle longest finger, despite the fact it's in the cold water. It's slightly complicated why this happens. It's actually because of something called surround inhibition. So the warm receptors in the skin of the two flanking fingers, the ring and index fingers, they actually go into the spinal cord and those warm fibres suppress the nerve cells coming from the longest finger that normally say it's cold. And because cold sensations suppress pain sensations, if you suppress the cold, you're suppressing the thing that suppresses the pain, so the only thing left is pain, so you feel pain, even though you've not actually injured anything. But here's the amazing thing. If you do this to two hands, Patrick Haggard at University College London and his colleagues have found and published in Current Biology this week, you do this on both of your hands. If you then lift the hands when you're having the sensation out of the water, put the fingers together so that the index finger, the longest finger and the ring fingers touch pad to pad, what do you think happens to the pain? It goes away. It doesn't completely go away, but it drops by 60%, just suddenly disappears by 60%. And this is really bizarre. And get this, it's not just the fact that something is touching the skin, because if you do this on somebody else, it doesn't work. And if you do it on a hand, your other hand, but you haven't had your other hand having the same illusion, it doesn't work. So what on earth is going on? That's what they wondered. The only thing they can think is that there's a group of nerve cells in the brain in an area called S2, which is your sensory cortex. It's where the signals, uh, your brain basically converges all of the information about what's happening in your body. There's a group of cells there which seem to build up what's called a, a coherence map of the body. And it uses this coherence map to work out where everything is, what the body's map is, and what's happening to all the tissues. And if there's some distortion of that map, then the cells misbehave and you get these funny sensations. But when the body is able to re-establish that co coherent map by bringing the two fingers together and you can compare one with the other, then it knows that this is an illusion and therefore it switches off the funny sensation. And what the researchers are saying is that actually understanding how this works could really inform our treatment of things like phantom limb pain because when this happens, you lose a body part, the body map doesn't know that that body part is missing and therefore signals which are originally thought to have be, been coming from that part of the body, are then over-amplified in the nervous system and that part of the body is deemed to be excruciatingly painful even though it's no longer there and the symptoms eventually go away when the brain rewrites that map. So understanding how this map is established in the first place, perhaps using tools like this illusion, may actually help in the treatment of people who have nasty things like phantom limb pain. Great one. Well, let's hope it does work anyway. If you'd like to follow up on any of those stories, the details, the references and more are all on our website at nakedscientist.com forward slash news. Lifting the lab coat on the world's best science. The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith and with Kat Arney. Still to come, of course, we've got the second uh, episode of our Naked Engineering segment. We're looking this week at the science of superconductivity, and that's because superconductivity is used in MRI scanners, and the focus of this week's show is how the nervous system works and how we're using scanners to see deeper into the brain than we've ever seen before. Kat? Now, a satellite designed to measure the Earth's gravitational field with unprecedented accuracy may sound like something out of a James Bond film, but it is, in fact, a reality. Now, the European Goche spacecraft, or Gravity Field and Steady State Ocean Circulation Explorer, <coughs> let's give it its full name, has been doing just that and has recently sent back its first results. Here's Richard Hollingham. The launch of the dart-shaped Goche satellite from the Russian Prosect Cosmodrome in March 2009. It's definitely the Formula One of satellites, if you like. It's designed to slip through the atmosphere as easily as possible. 18 months later, in her office at the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton, Helen Snaith is studying the first data from this sleek satellite. 
Its primary mission is to measure the Earth's gravity field at very small spatial scales. It's to see the very, very small changes in the gravity as you go around the Earth and ultimately to be able to use that information to get to ocean circulation. We'll talk about that in a second, but let's look at the first results. You've got some of these early results through up on your screen here. It's an image of the Earth, but it's a lumpy, bumpy, multicoloured, almost like a, a rock like Earth. This is an image that's been generated to show just how lumpy the Earth actually is. If you looked at the Earth, it's not completely smooth. We all know it's not completely smooth. We have mountains, we have oceans, we have valleys. But they have an effect on the gravity field as well. So the gravity field isn't the same all the way around the Earth. When you do maths at senior school, you get taught that acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 metres per second squared. Unfortunately, that's not strictly true. There are very small changes as you go around the Earth. If you go over the Himalayas, there's more mass, there's more mountains, there's more gravity. So things are pulled towards them. If you go over deep trenches in the ocean... There's less mass, there's less gravity, and things aren't pulled towards them as much. It's these small changes as you go around the Earth that we're trying to measure with Gauche, and which you can see exaggerated an awful lot on this image. OK, so you have a map of the Earth's gravity field, which is what this satellite is producing. You want to use that to work out ocean currents. How do you make that leap? Because the gravity field isn't the same everywhere, the water in the oceans isn't being pulled down to the same level everywhere. So if the water was completely still and there were no ocean currents, it would be a bumpy surface. But if you put a ball down on that surface, it wouldn't roll anywhere. It would stay where it is, which is a slightly strange concept to be able to get your head round. But this is where we're coming from. What we're trying to calculate now is the difference between that nice smooth steady state that if there were no currents this is the shape of the sea surface and what we actually measure the difference between those two is what's being caused by the ocean currents so the only way you can work out really the impact of the ocean currents or the height of the water as a result of these ocean currents is by removing the gravity from that exactly that's precisely what we want to do we can use an altimeter, satellite altimeter, to measure the precise height of the sea surface at, at any given time when the altimeter flies op- over. What we don't know is how much of that height is being caused by the gravity field or that change in height. With Goche, we can start to get a handle on that. That's what we're really interested in. OK, you're interested in it. Why is it important to, to learn or work out where the ocean currents are and, and what effect they're having? The ocean currents are a really important part of the heat transport system of the ocean. What we're trying to do is to monitor those currents and see how consistent they are, how strong they are, whether there's changes in those currents. To be able to do that, we need to be able to monitor them globally. Satellites give us one of the few options we have of being able to look at the currents everywhere in a consistent way. That was Helen Smith from the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton talking with the Planet Earth podcast's Richard Hollingham. And there's more episodes of the Planet Earth podcast as well as a longer version of that interview you've just heard. And they're all at nakedscientist.com slash planet earth. Using computers to read the mind might seem more suited to the pages of a sci-fi thriller, but scientists are edging closer to this reality using brain imaging technology like Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or FMRI. Professor Jack Gallant and his team from the University of California at Berkeley have been using FMRI uh, to work out from patterns of brain activity what people are looking at. Jack's with us now. Hello, Jack. Hello. Thank you for joining us on The Naked Scientist. Can you tell us, first of all, what actually is FMRI? How does it work? Well, uh, fMRI measures brain activity, but it does it rather indirectly. It it doesn't measure the activity of neurons in your brain. Instead, it measures changes in blood flow in your brain. So uh, when your neurons fire, they need to uh, use energy, and they get their energy by burning oxygen, uh, sorry, burning glucose with oxygen. And uh, they extract glucose and oxygen from the bloodstream continuously, as you think. And areas of your brain that are uh, more active, meaning more neurons are firing, tend to extract more oxygen and glucose from the bloodstream. And we can measure this using MRI. 
In other words, it's, uh, it's, it's a correlate of what the brain is doing. So when we present a stimulus at the brain and we look at which bits of the brain are using more oxygen through the signal in the fMRI scanner, that tells you that bit of the brain must have something to do with the stimulus that we're presenting and how it's being decoded. Right. It's a rather indirect measure of something that's correlated with uh, neural activity. Uh, and it's the best measure we have right now, the best uh, non-invasive measure of brain activity, but uh, the problem is that it has fairly low spatial and temporal resolution relative to the neurons themselves. So you're losing a lot of information, or you, or you can't recover a lot of the information that's actually going on in the brain. Still, it's, it's the best tool we have at the current time. So actually talk us through what it is that you're doing and how you're analyzing the signal that comes back from the brain. What sort of resolution can you get? Uh, well, a typical functional MRI uh, experiment that people do today will recover information from uh, a small area of the brain, small resolution of the brain at about 3 by 3 by 3 millimeters. Um, and so your brain is essentially divided into a large number of cubes, tens of thousands of these little 3 by 3 by 3 millimeter cubes called voxels. And for each individual voxel, we can build a model that describes how your brain encodes information. So for example, if we put you in a scanner and we show you pictures or movies, uh, we can construct these models called encoding models, and each small little voxel in the brain will have its own unique encoding model that describes how the movies or the still images are translated into changes in blood flow in that small region of the brain. And what does that actually tell you about the underlying structure of the brain in that region, the fact that you've got these little cubes and they're changing their activity? What can you infer about brain activity from the patterns of uh, activity that you see in the scanner? Uh, well, the encoding models essentially tell you how uh, the external world is translated into changes in blood flow. So if you show someone thousands and thousands of um, still images or, say, a few hours of movies, you can actually build a model that's quite general, and it describes how any possible visual stimulus that you could show that person gets translated into blood flow. Now, once you have that model, you can then uh, demonstrate that it's working by using it to identify on each individual second which movie or which picture they saw. And once you've verified that the model is accurately identifying the image or movie they saw, you can actually show the subject a completely new movie or image that they never saw before, and you can actually reconstruct that movie or image from the blood flow that you've measured. Does this give us a clue, though, how the brain is actually wired up? So when you look at how the brain responds to a picture you show, does this inform the way in which it's decoded or deconstructed cognitively to, to then present to consciousness what we're seeing when we experience that stimulus? Well, absolutely. In fact, that's the entire point. Um, the brain processes visual information with uh, a large number of different brain areas. There's probably something between, say, 50 and 75 different brain areas that are involved in visual function. And the goal of our lab is to actually build computational models that describe how all of these different brain areas work. So when you uh, undertake these, to build these encoding models, what you're really trying to do is construct a quantitative theory of the way the brain processes visual information. And decoding is simply a way of verifying that your theory is actually correct. If you have a correct encoding model that describes how information is translated into patterns of brain activity, then you should be able to decode accurately and reconstruct the, the stimulus that a person saw. But the, that's sort of a side effect, and uh, it's actually just a mathematical trick. The main goal is to build an accurate encoding model. And once you have that, uh, decoding sort of comes along for free. And if I compare how the brain of one person responds to a picture postcard and then I present the same picture postcard to a second subject, do you get broadly the same activity in the brains of the two individuals? In other words, could you build a system that will pretty well work out what they're seeing? Or is it so user end user specific that you'd have to train the system to look at each individual in order to do it with any particular level of accuracy? Uh, well, the answer is somewhere in the middle there. Uh, individual brains vary a huge amount. Just like individuals have different height and different weight, the size and shape of individual brains varies a lot. So if you build a sort of generic model that you can apply to any brain, you will be able to decode some coarse information, but the model will never work uh, particularly well. If you want to recover a lot of information from someone's brain, you're going to have to build a unique model for each individual person's brain. So tell us about the experiments that you've actually done to show that this can be done, it can be done successfully. 
Uh, well, our published experiments uh, have involved static images, and uh, the procedure is pretty simple. We put somebody in the magnets, and we show them, say, two to five hours of uh, uh, images. These are just flashed every few seconds, and they passively view them. And uh, after we get an, a large enough data set, then uh, we can construct these encoding models on a computer. Uh, and then we simply put them back in the magnet and we show them new images that they've never seen before. And we use the computers to reconstruct the images that they actually saw. In our more recent work uh, that has not yet been published and it's still in peer review, we've shown that you can do this with movies as well. And that was kind of an interesting challenge because uh, the blood flow signals measured by MRI are very, very slow. You're only getting a snapshot of the brain once every one to two seconds. And at that rate, it's actually quite a um, challenging problem to try to reconstruct uh, the motion of, of natural visual stimuli. So how are you getting around that? Is the, are you going for things like if there's a very, very apparent thing in the movie which triggers a certain response in that person, say the person sees a post box or a cat and their brain's going to respond strongly to the post box or the cat, is it that that you're picking up rather than the fact that you've got a moving image going across and lots of stimuli being presented sequentially? Uh, it's actually both. So uh, remember earlier I said that your brain has probably something on the order of 50 to 75 distinct visual areas. No one's really sure exactly how many visual areas there are. What you ideally want to do is build a, um, an accurate encoding model for each individual visual area. And that encoding model will describe the, inf the way information is processed in that specific visual area. And it will describe the features in the uh, natural images or natural movies that are essentially represented explicitly in that area. And once you have those individual models, then when you do decoding, you aggregate information from all of these different visual areas. So visual areas that are sensitive to motion, but they don't care what the moving object is, then you will reconstruct the absolute motion from those areas. Other visual areas that may be more uh, involved in semantic information, like they may respond to people talking or to vehicles moving, you'll reconstruct the semantic category from those areas. And then you aggregate all that data together to produce a, a reconstruction. And if you can get this working at an even better resolution than you do at the moment, what are the, the big questions that you now want to go on and answer with this tool? Uh, well, again, the main goal here is to build encoding models. And what we want to do is to be able to perfectly predict all of the brain activity in uh, as much of the brain as we can. So uh, we haven't gotten particularly far on that part yet. Uh, we are uh, still in the process of building more and more accurate encoding models, especially for the more mysterious visual areas, and that work will be going on for quite some time. But um, all of the mathematical algorithms we use for, doing, uh, for constructing the encoding models and for doing decoding can be applied pretty much anywhere in the brain. So, for example, you could imagine uh, building encoding models for auditory areas, for recovering uh, music and speech processing. Um, you could imagine building these models for the frontal areas of the brain that are involved in abstract thought. And that work will be going on for a long time because there are few computational theories uh, that neuroscientists have right now that describe accurately how the higher order sort of more mysterious parts of the brain actually work. Right now we're working on the visual system because it's relatively easy relative to all the other parts of the brain. We all know what the visual system does. We have some rough ideas of how it's laid out uh, and we can control the input very carefully. If we try to build a model of the front part of the brain where you think about your future and you plan and all those sorts of things, it's both very difficult to model those areas and it's very difficult to control the input to those areas. So progress in building encoding and decoding models for more abstract parts of the brain is going to proceed much, much more slowly. All right, well, we must leave it there, but thank you for being with us, Jack, and don't go away because we've got a whole heap of questions for you to answer later on in the programme. That's UC Berkeley's Professor Jack Gallant. Another use of brain scanning techniques is to look at what might be happening when some people encounter unusual mental manifestations such as hallucinations and delusions. And we're joined now by Cambridge University's Professor Paul Fletcher and he's here to explain how this can be done and what it's revealing. Hello Paul. Hello. Um, so if you could tell us uh, a little bit about um, what fMRI can actually tell us about what's going on in the brain and what it can't actually tell us yet. I think some people think it's maybe a magic mind-reading machine. Where are we at the moment with this technology? Well, as we were just hearing from Dr Gallant, um, fMRI is a way of looking at which different bits of the brain respond when people are asked to do things or when they're having particular experiences. 
from my perspective, it's very interesting because we can start to look at the areas of the brain that become active uh, when somebody is experiencing quite unpleasant symptoms that co-occur with mental illnesses. So, for example, a hallucination where somebody is um, perceiving something that isn't actually there, for example, hearing a voice when there's nobody around or seeing something that isn't there, or, or delusions where they believe very strange things, often very unpleasant things, such as the, that their neighbour is trying to kill them or something. And fMRI offers us a way of, of putting them into the scanner and looking at how their brain is behaving in, in uh, this sort of setting. So how are you actually doing this in practical terms? What, what's your research involving? Well, the first thing is I'm not actually terribly interested in trying to map the hallucination to the brain. I think that would be a lovely thing to do, but the problem is if you lie somebody in the scanner and they're having a hallucination, you can get them to indicate uh, when the hallucination occurs and you can watch ch what changes in the brain are, uh, are occurring then. But you don't actually know whether those changes are the cause of the hallucination, which would be very interesting, or whether they're actually a consequence. For example, if I'm hearing a voice, uh, my brain will respond to that voice even though it's not causing that voice. Or they may be a compensation, so a, a hallucination can be very unpleasant, and the, the, the changes we see in the brain might actually be a result of somebody trying to suppress the unpleasant thoughts and connotations. So I'm much more interested in trying to um, use functional imaging to try and test particular cognitive or psychological models of how the hallucination occurs, what computations in the brain may be disturbed uh, as a prelude to um, the hallucinations or the delusion. So you're trying to sort of strip out some of these variables. How are you actually doing that? Well, we're taking as our starting point uh, an acknowledgement that actually pretty much all of us live in a fantasy world where we are hallucinating quite a lot of the time. We're creating our own reality. Um, the reason being that if we were to try and sample all of our neural inputs at once, all of the sensations that are impinging on our brain, we would um, be totally paralysed by information. And a consequence of that is we start to take shortcuts. And we start to process the world not so much because of, uh, as a result of what is there, but of what we expect to be there. And I think we can think of our brains as being this a very delicate balance between what we're predicting to see or hear or feel and what we're actually uh, experiencing through our, our neural apparatus. And uh, my belief is that we can start to understand some of the symptoms of mental illness by looking at this balance and by acknowledging that there's a very important signal in the brain that almost pervades all neural firing, which is the mismatch between what we expect and what we've got, the so-called prediction error. And so what we can do is look at how prediction error firing in the brain occurs in people with and without hallucinations and see if that is uh, disordered in some way. For example, do they appear to um, show surprise or prediction error by things that should actually be highly predictable? Or con contrarily, do they show um, an absence of prediction error when there should be something surprising occurring? So we can use imaging to test this and, and in, in so doing try and understand the basis of these experiences. So I understand that you're using a drug called ketamine to try and make people hallucinate. My my friend had this when he broke his leg. The doctors gave it to him and he said that the doctors were fine putting his leg back together, but they were all talking backwards. Um, what can that tell us about hallucinations in a scanner? Well, the big advantage of ketamine is that you can control it. You can control the dose that somebody gets. You can infuse it. You can keep them at a particular level for a certain amount of time. And you can watch how their brain responds. You know, you're not reliant on the chance and randomness of normal um, hallucinatory experiences. So we use ketamine as a way of producing very temporarily these experiences and seeing what it does to the brain as a way of trying to understand how the hallucinations or delusions might arise in the context of mental illness. And so what how do we actually, what do we think about what is going on in mental illness when people are having these hallucinations and delusions? Well, what's actually going on in their brain? What have you found out so far? Well, what we seem to be finding is that people with these experiences are actually getting false signals in their brain that the world around them has become surprising and is, is sort of baffling their expectations they ha can have um, very strong expectations about what they're about to see or hear. And even if what they do see or hear actually fulfills those expectations, nevertheless their brain is telling them that it is wrong. And so consequently they have to keep changing their predictions, rebuilding their models of the world, trying to understand the world in new and ever more often bizarre ways. And I think there's, there's good evidence emerging across our work and a series of other studies elsewhere that this may be a fundamental deficit in uh, certain mental illnesses.
And so really briefly to touch on this, um, we sometimes hear about some great creative artists, very creative people who are also judged to be mentally unstable or mentally unwell. Do you think maybe that some people who are extremely creative are slightly unhinged in this way, that their hallucinations are maybe coming to the surface more? I think that's a very interesting point, and certainly people have, have played with that idea. My, my own feeling is that up to a point, um, the sorts of processes that might be deranged in um, hallucinations and delusions, up to a point, uh, actually having a slight derangement in those could be advantageous because it might lead you to look at the world in very new and salient and original ways that might actually give you insights that perhaps uh, you wouldn't normally get by just predicting the world, it always fulfilling your predictions. So I think there may be a link there, but I have yet to actually draw it, um, and so I wouldn't want to speculate too much. Absolutely fascinating, then, a, a line between genius and madness. That was Cambridge University's Professor Paul Fletcher. Kat, thank you. You're listening to The Naked Scientist. It's Chris Smith and Kat Arney. We're talking this week about brain science and how we can delve into the workings of the brain and as we've discussed MRI scanners have helped us to make huge advances in our understanding of how brains are structured and what they actually do and as we've just heard how they can go wrong but what does an MRI scanner have in common with a maglev that's a levitating train here's Miracentha Lingam to explain this week on Naked Engineering, we're going to be looking into superconductivity. So what better place to come along to to find out about this than the bulk superconductivity lab in the engineering department here at the University of Cambridge. Now, Dave is here with me, of course. Tell us a bit about this phenomenon. Well, it's all to do with conductivity, which is, of course, how easy it is to push electricity through a material. Things like copper are very good conductors and things like plastics can be very bad conductors, or good insulators. Now, this was a, actually a really bizarre effect, which was discovered by Kamerling Honors in 1911. He was measuring the resistance of, it happened to be mercury, and all of a sudden the resistance went to zero, so the conductivity became infinite, which is absolutely bizarre. It's a bit like friction completely disappearing. It's not something you'd ever expect to happen. And joining us this week is David Cardwell, the Professor of Superconducting Engineering at the University of Cambridge. You've actually got a fascinating demonstration set up here in front of us to show this lack of resistance or superconductivity in action. Uh, right, we've got a, a bulk superconductor. So this superconducts at liquid nitrogen temperature, so the nitrogen's bubbling away there. Ni liquid nitrogen temperature is uh, 77 Kelvin, which is minus 196 degrees C, so it's pretty cold. What we're going to do is bring the superconductor, which is in a superconducting state, which means it doesn't have any of this resistance that Dave's been talking about. We're going to bring it over the magnet. That will actually expose the material to a changing magnetic field. Uh, that will induce currents in the superconductor, and those currents will generate its own magnetic field, which will interact with the field that we're using to magnetize it. It all sounds pretty complicated, but the net result of that is that the superconductor will levitate uh, almost magically above the magnet in a very stable way when we do this demonstration. What is the superconductor actually made of? Well, it's a fairly complex mix of, uh, of elements. So this one's yttrium, barium, copper and oxygen. It's got the form and consistency of a, a standard ceramic, so it's hard and brittle, but with this unique property that it loses its resistance to the flow of current at this very well-defined temperature. It's about 90 Kelvin. Uh, we make it at high temperatures, as we do all ceramics, but this is just very special in that it's got these very unique superconducting properties. Well, as you mentioned, it's been cooling away for a while now. There's a magnet just next to it, so are we ready to place it on top? OK, so here's the superconductor. We're putting it onto the magnet, and you can see uh, the superconductor is now levitating above the magnet. There's a good centimetre air gap there. Uh, the superconductor is now warming up because it's in the atmosphere. Obviously, it's not in liquid nitrogen anymore. When it gets to its superconducting transition temperature, which is about 90 Kelvin, uh, it'll lose its superconductivity, the currents will stop flowing, and it will just sink down to the magnet. Ooh, and it's just gone. Yeah, so uh, the superconductivity disappeared in the material. Now, Dave, why is this superconductor levitating? A large part of it goes back to some basic physics discovered by Faraday in the 19th century. This is something you might have done at school. Um, so what I've got here is a coil of wire, um, which is quite a good conductor, rigged up to a voltmeter, and a big magnet. If I put the magnet through the coil of wire, something rather beautiful happens to the meter. The voltage is changing. Yeah. You in, in fact, it's not just changing, it's being created. Um, when the magnet moves near this coil of wire, you induce a voltage which pushes a current around the wire which the meter picks up. This current can be used for all sorts of things. It's how a generator works, so all the electricity is generated like this. But 
in this case, um, what we've got is a very similar setup. You've got a magnet and a conductor. So if we move some magnets near some other conductors, so I think, David, you've got a nice demo here. We have a copper tube here, and we have a two samples. We've got a copper sample, which is non-magnetic. When I drop the, the copper sample down the tube, uh, nothing will happen because there's no changing field, so it'll be like it's just falling through normal free space. So if I'm going to drop this down now, and you'll see uh, it falls down immediately. That moved down pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so now I have a, a stack of uh, neodymium boron iron magnets. Uh, there are four magnets. It's a, it's a small sphere, basically, a small cylinder. And I'm going to do exactly the same experiment. So the, the moving magnet is going to create a voltage, it's going to create a big current, and a big current flowing in a circle is an electromagnet, which should hold up this magnet. So the magnet's going to move down a lot slower then? Right. OK, so it's just going through, and it's moving a lot slower. Yes, that's right. Uh, so this voltage is induced, uh, as Dave said, the current flows. Um, that current generates the field. That interacts with the, the magnet as it falls down and impedes its progress. So it takes a lot longer to, to kind of decrease. And it's just come out now. And, of course, the only reason why it's dropping is because there's a resistance in this copper. So these induced currents slowly die away, so it has to drop a bit more to build up another one. If the copper was a perfect conductor, like a superconductor, there'd be no reason for those currents to die away. So it would just stay at the top of the tube? Yeah, it would just drop a little bit, induce enough currents to support itself, and it would levitate like we were doing earlier. But now, the levitation itself that you showed earlier, David, isn't as straightforward as simply just putting the magnet on and it just stays there, is it? There's a stable and unstable way of doing this. Right, yeah, these materials have yet more secrets to reveal. If we look at the microstructure, uh, it has what we call pinning centres. And what pinning centres do is resist the motion of magnetic flux in the material. So when we try to get magnetic field into the superconductor, it's difficult to do so. So we have to apply a force, we have to apply energy. But when field is in there, when mag magnetic flux lines are in the material, they don't want to come out. And what are these flux lines then exactly? So the flux lines are individual flux quanta that exist in the material and define the magnetic field in a superconductor. When field enters superconductors, it does so in the form of individual lines of magnetic flux, and it's these individual lines that we can stop moving by these pinning centres. And if we can do that, this gives rise to stable levitation. When the field is in there, it doesn't want to leave. So it actually combines itself with the magnet that's providing that flux. So the superconductor, the magnet, and the air gap effectively become as one. OK, so let's see the unstable way in action. So here I'm just putting the superconductor on top of the magnet, uh, so it's levitating away there. If I just apply a sideways force to the superconductor, no resistance whatsoever. Unstable levitation. Okay. So now what are you going to do to make that stable? Right, so I'm going to do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to cool the superconductor down, which I'm doing now. I'm going to put it on the magnet, so it's levitating again. I'm now pressing the superconductor down onto the surface of the magnet, so now flux is penetrating the superconductor. Oh, and it appears to just have be locked in now. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it looks like it's uh, levitating again as the first case, but now we've got stable levitation, so I can turn the whole thing upside down as well. That's incredible. So you've turned the magnet on its side now. You've even, you're now turning it upside down, and the magnet is just not separating. It's still maintaining that gap levitating about, what, a, a centimetre's gap off the magnet. So we've got stable levitation, we've got stable suspension, the whole system is stable, and this forms a basis of things like uh, magnetic levitation or suspension, things like uh, the railways that we see quite often on the television. And now, Dave, one, say, more well-known application is the use of these superconductors in MRI scanners, so magnetic resonance imaging. Yeah, these are probably one of the biggest uses of superconductors today. Um, they're actually using a much older fashioned form of superconductor, a low-temperature superconductor, which only works at liquid helium temperatures, only about four degrees above absolute zero, or minus about 269 degrees centigrade. These basically use the superconductor to produce a huge magnetic field which affects the way the nuclei in your body interact with radio waves. You can then change these magnetic fields a lot and do a huge amount of complicated computer processing and work out what you look like inside. This is producing a 3D picture of your body and unlike x-rays which are very good at seeing bones and hard parts of your body, an MRI scan is very good at seeing the squishy bits which doctors find very, very useful. And now, David, though, most MRI scanners that you see in hospitals, they're large, they're very costly. Mm. But with your work, David, you're actually looking into low-resolution MRI, which could have perhaps a wider range of applications. Yeah, the idea is that if we can use bulk high-temperature superconductors to generate large magnetic fields, although those fields won't be as stable as the fields needed for these very high-resolution scans that we described earlier, what we may be able to do is to develop 
an instrument that is accessible and very cheap. So it would be open. Uh, we may be able to do, uh, rather than an MRI image, we could do a spectrum scan. So, for example, we could look at a knee, we could look at selected spectra, and use that as a diagnostic tool. These would be very low-cost devices, obviously low resolution, but one could imagine these being deployed in every doctor's surgery for very quick diagnosis of some fairly simple joint issues or even base of head issues. So that's uh, one potential use of these materials. But there are many others. Other things like motors and generators using bulk material, you can get rid of some of the iron so you can make much lighter, much smaller motors and generators. Things like magnetic levitators for trains. And I think the next five to ten years are going to be revolutionary in terms of real applications of these materials. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, David, and Dave, of course. That's it for Naked Engineering for this week. But who knows, you may see one of David Cardwell's low-resolution MRI scanners in your GPs soon. Mira Senthalingam and Dave Ansell talking with Cambridge University engineer David Cardwell about the science of superconductivity. Naked Engineering is produced with support from the Royal Academy of Engineering's Ingenious Grant Programme. Distilling the best science. The Naked Scientists. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientists.com. You're listening to The Naked Scientists. It's Chris Smith and with Kat Arney. We're talking about how the brain works and using brain imaging technology in order to see further inside the brain than anyone has seen before. We've got a whole heap of questions here for our two guests who are with us this week, Paul Fletcher and also Jack Gallant. Um, why don't we start with this one? Um, Evil Eye Monster says, Why do I talk out loud when I dream? My wife hears only half the conversation. I don't even remember it. Paul, any speculations? I haven't got a clue, to be honest. <laughs> so, Jack? No, <I'm laughs> well, if Jack's got any ideas, he can, he can go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I have, I'm not an expert in dreams, so I, I don't have any information here either. I mean, my own view would be that the nervous system suppresses uh, the motor system when we actually go to sleep, which is why we don't end up acting out more of our dreams, because of the, this region in the brainstem that stops the motor pathways going through, and that will include some of the more complicated movements in, that make vocalisations happening, but you're still in your dream going to be talking and things, aren't you? So uh, that's why you will talk out loud sometimes. I, th- I guess there'll be a breakthrough of that suppression activity. Here's an interesting one, though, perhaps focused uh, in your direction, Paul. David Worley, 94. If you can get auditory and visual hallucinations, then can you get ones that make you believe that you can smell or touch things? You certainly can. You can get hallucinations in any uh, sensory modality. You can get uh, uh, hallucinations of taste, smell, touch, as well as visual and auditory. And in fact, um, in certain cases of mental illness, um, hallucinations of smell can be exceedingly unpleasant and people can have the belief that they're actually rotting from the inside. Doesn't sound very pleasant. It sounds horrible. (laughs) Thank you, Paul. Um, This one is definitely one for you, Jack. Jake wonders, do we really use only 10% of our brains, or is that a myth? I think that's definitely a myth. We use uh, a lot of our brains a lot of the time, and it switches back and forth all the time, which which, uh, subsystems of the brain are being used depend on the task and what you're trying to do. But um, the brain's there for a reason, and you're, you're using a lot of it most of the time. I guess. Uh, sorry, sorry, Paul. I was just thinking, uh, the person who started that rumour was probably using 10% of their brain at the time, I think. <laughs> Very good. The point is, if you look at someone who's had a stroke, um, and they may have only lost a small amount of their brain, they nonetheless don't look normal, or they may not behave entirely normally, indicating that you need all of your brain, it's just slightly less active at certain times. I would, yes, I although, I mean, one could add that um, people who've had, you know, hemispherectomy, a whole half of their brain removed at an early age, actually go on to achieve um, great things intellectually. So if it happens early enough and the brain is sufficiently plastic, then actually you can do without a lot of the volume of the brain. But I think you would use what was there uh, 100%. Here's an interesting one. Um, this is from Greg Komarov, who's on our Facebook page. If a hallucination is seeing what isn't there, how would the brain scan then see the same thing which isn't there? I guess that's one for you, Paul. Um, no, that's a great <laughs> metaphysical question. Um, I mean, the, the brain scan is looking at how the brain believes, or how the brain behaves when it is seeing something that isn't there. So it's not so much interested or able to see the, the, the content of that, although, as we've just heard from Jack, actually, the possibility of seeing what the brain thinks is there is, is possibly uh, something for the future. Uh, any comment on that, Jack? Yeah, I think uh, there's growing evidence that when you have a visual hallucination, what's actually happening is the visual areas of your brain are being activated, essentially top-down from, from inside out. And um, the visual experiences you have in the visual hallucination are, since they're visual, in, in, uh, since the brain subsystems are being operated, 
in those cases are visual, then you both experience visual events and you could decode visual events because you're decoding from the same parts of the brain that are encoding visual information normally. And hence, you, you, what you've got is this system where it, you think it's real because it's the same bit of the brain that would say, yep, I'm experiencing something, but it's just being internally generated. Right. Okay. Right, well, there's, I, don't, I don't know if there's time just to look at this one very quickly. Um, Lenora, during Culture 37, we've got 30 seconds, Jack. What are the long-term consequences of, of so many brain scans uh, or scans on other organs? Is there any risk? Uh, as far as anyone knows, there is no long-term uh, danger from MRI. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging um, involves putting someone in a very large stationary magnetic field. As far as anyone knows, this has no influence on uh, any systems of the body or any, any biological systems. It's very reassuring. We have to leave it there because otherwise we're going to run out of time. Cat. And now here's another question. It's Diana O'Carroll with a pithy question of the week. This week, was Snow White forced to eat apple cores? Hi, my name's Hannah. My friend the other day told me not to eat my apple core and made me throw it in the bin. I was wondering why. Are they poisonous? What's wrong with the crunchiest bit of the apple? Hi, I'm John Fry and I'm a consultant in food science. The question is, is it dangerous to eat apple cores? Well, it could be, but only under rather extreme circumstances. Apple seeds contain a substance called amygdalin that can release cyanide under the right circumstances, such as contact with digestive enzymes. The cyanide is linked to sugars in the form of a cyanogenic glycoside, and these cyanide-releasing compounds are remarkably common in nature. They occur in more than 2,000 plant species, some of them important foods like cassava. They also crop up in stone fruits like plums, peaches, apricots, and famously bitter almonds. It's often said that cyanide smells of bitter almonds, but actually it's the other way round. Bitter almonds smell of cyanide. You need about one milligram of cyanide per kilo of body weight to kill a human being. Apple seeds contain about 700 milligrams of cyanide per kilo, so about 100 grams of apple seeds should be enough to dispatch a 70 kilogram adult human. Uh, but that's an awful lot of apple cores, even if you don't eat the rest of the apple first. In addition, the seeds would have to be pretty finely crushed to let the enzyme get to the amygdalin at all. All in all, you're safe eating the occasional apple core. I've done it for years. Just don't try eating a bowl of freshly crushed apple pips. If a seed weighs 0.7 grams, then you'd need to munch your way through 143 seeds. Apples can contain anywhere between 2 and 20 pips, but a typical supermarket apple will contain about 8. So you'd have to eat about 18 apple cores in one sitting. On Twitter, SJ Caffin said that he always understood there were traces of arsenic in the seeds of apples. or well, close, but no cigar. On Facebook, Lorraine Rose Schumacher, Adam Watts and Tommy A300 on the forum were closer with cyanide. And Tony Singleton said that apple cores are dangerous when carrying submachine guns. He wins our Comedian of the Week prize. Next week, what goes up must come down, right? My name is Brenda. When I was on holiday in Barbados, there was a road that seemed to defy the laws of gravity. If you placed a football at the end of the road, which was quite steep downhill... The ball moved up the hill. I thought it was some kind of optical illusion at first, but tried it myself, and the ball did indeed move uphill against gravity. How is this possible? How does such an optical illusion work? Send your answers to us the usual ways, either by emailing chris at thenakedscientists.com, use the forum at thenakedscientists.com forward slash forum, or you can use our Facebook page, or you can Twitter us with at Naked Scientists. So what do you think? Was the ball really defying gravity and rolling uphill? Or can our eyes actually be tricked quite easily? Diana will be back with the answer next week. Absolutely fantastic stuff. Well, unfortunately, like all good things, they must end and we've run out of time for this week. Thank you very much for listening and join me also in thanking our wonderful production team here at The Naked Scientist, Sarah Caster-Perry, Diana O'Carroll, Julia Graham, Smita Mandasad, Mira Senthalingam and Dave Ansell. And also thank you very much to our guests this week who are Jack Gallant and Paul Fletcher.
We're back next week with a Q&A extravaganza. We're answering all of your science questions. So if you would like us to answer a question for you in that show, then send them in now by email to chris at thenakedscientist.com. You can scribble them down on our Facebook page. You just look up Naked Scientists on Facebook or tweet us. It's at Naked Scientists. I should warn you, in the meantime, you've got just about a week left to have a go at the survey and win yourself some Amazon vouchers if you're first out of the hat. That's our analysis of what you think of this programme and it's on the web at nakedscientist.com forward slash survey. Thanks for joining us and until next time, goodbye. The Naked Scientists comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC, the Natural Environment Research Council and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at thenakedscientists.com. <laughs>